There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I rearranged my books, gave you some new uh, books to look at when you're ignoring what I have to say. <laughs> I am here to finish up my December wrap-up. I did part one yesterday and this will be the last chunk. This is all the good news. Part one was my bales and I had one two-star read and one three-star read and I gave you two of my four-star reads. So the rest of it is all the rest of the really great reading experiences I had, a bunch of four- and five-star reads. Because I've reviewed uh, several of them already, it should go quick, but famous last words. Resuming my rundown of my four-star reads, this biography of Princess Margaret, Ma'am Darling, 99 Glimpses of Princess Margaret by Craig Brown. came out uh, in the fall last year and I ordered it as soon as it became available because I am a Princess Margaret groupie. I really enjoyed this biography. I loved it at first and by the end I just liked it. But I thought it was really innovative in bite-sized kind of essayistic chapters and situating Princess Margaret within the culture and showing the ways in which she helped shape culture and I was really intrigued by how it was structured because I hate traditional biographies. They're so effing boring. But by the end, it kind of lost steam and just became gossipy and the structure, well, it was, it remained bite-sized chapters. Really, the gossipy chronology was continuing from the end of one little chapter to the beginning of the next one. It, I think he just kind of lost the, he lost the book. But I still really enjoyed it because... Princess Margaret! I have a full review on this. I will link below. Another four-star read in December was an Italian novel called The Break by Pietro Grossi. And this was a enjoyably strange little novel. I don't remember when it was published, but I think within the last ten years. And, tr of course, translated. And it's about a Tuscan stonemason who lays... Uh, stone roads in the same way that his father, grandfather, and great-great-great-great-great-grandfather built the roads in his little town for centuries. He's married, and happily so, but they don't have kids, and they keep dreaming about where they want to travel, and as the novel opens, she is sh she announces that she's pregnant, and he says, well, what about all the travel that we were going to do? Well, they'd been married apparently for, I don't know, 15 years or 20 years, and they'd never ever traveled anywhere. And she said, uh, hello. And around the same time, he finds out that the municipal government of his town is finally moving to asphalt roads. So he's going to be out of a job where he has to learn the new modern way of road making, and he is repulsed by that. He's also a cracker billiard player and apparently there's an Italian version of the game and he's a master of that and all of those threads work together in kind of a it's not magical realism but there's a kind of eerie quirky narrative energy that I'm not sure it quite worked as a whole but boy I was sure not bored that's enough said oh next I really wish I had the time and energy to do a separate review of this because this book is really sticking with me since I read it on the plane coming back to Tokyo on New Year's Eve. I mentioned it briefly in my book haul video, but this is a new-to-me Canadian novel from 1972, and it is No Pain Like This Body by Harold Sonny Ladu. I think I pronounced it Lado before. I, the more I look at it, it's probably Ladu. He was a Trinidadian Canadian writer, and he only wrote two novels, and this was his debut. I'd never heard of him until I saw this in the bookstore in Saskatoon. But look at that. Isn't it beautiful? And the writing is really beautiful. It's about a poor family in 1905 in uh, uh, Trinidadian island called Carib Island, Indo-Trinidadian family, and it's a really screwed up family. They're dirt poor rice farmers, 
and the father is incredibly abusive and violent and the mother is trying to protect her young children from the father and there's it's like you say it's really a tough going this story the same day that I started this I bailed on that other novel about the awful Norwegian sisters and the difference with this was that there was a loving set of grandparents that I could kind of anchor myself to emotionally but it is a really tough story beautifully written short hundred page novella that I very much want to read again and Harold Sonny Ladue's life was fascinating and tragically short uh, he had just completed his second novel when he went back to Trinidad for a visit and was murdered and no the murder was never solved he died just a year or so after this book was published really intriguing little novel I if you don't mind stories that are brutal and dark this is a, a gem the last four star read I also read on the plane coming back to Japan last week a really short novella called Nagasaki by Eric Fay I haven't been able to find out too much about Eric Fay but he's a French journalist he wrote this based on a news story that was in the Japanese press in 2008 about a Nagasaki meteorologist who discovered that a homeless woman had been living in the house with him unbeknownst to him for months if not years and he finally noticed that little food was missing out of the fridge or things and he set up a webcam and, and she was caught that way and there was a trial so the novel follows the news story which i hadn't heard of before very closely but does a wonderful job of fictionalizing it it's a very philosophical novel meditating on isolation loneliness this man lived by himself he'd never married and homelessness and economic inequality japanese society i really liked it it has stuck with me and it's quite a philosophical almost reads in places like an essay and often that for me is a bad thing but here it just really worked and i'm not a big fan of modern french fiction so again i was uh, very fortunate to find this and uh, enjoy it as much as i did check it out i don't imagine it's that easy to find but so those were my four star reads in december and now i've got a swack of five star reads to tell you about the first one is my greatest reading achievement of 2017, The Collected Stories of Mavis Gallant, 950 pages. I've mentioned it on umpteen Friday reads, so I will just briefly say that I started reading this collection in January and finished it in mid-December. Loved it. I had read quite a few Mavis Gallant stories over the years, but now I've read 52, many of which were new to me. Mavis Gallant at about the age of 30 or 27 or something up and left Montreal as a as a young divorcee journalist moved to Paris and never left and started writing short stories which were very soon published in the New Yorker and she published more than a hundred stories in the New Yorker over her literary career she died in 2014 at the age of 91 and she wrote almost up until she died her stories concern exile and expatriate lives they're not emotional stories usually but or the, the emotion comes through in the atmosphere the tone of the story she was a very independent woman who never married and had a horribly sad and uh, emotionally wounding childhood and a lot of that comes through in her stories not everyone's cup of tea i know i'm the only one on booktube talking about her and I hope that situation will change. Uh, next is a 2015 novel from the UK, The Year of the Runaways by Sunjeev Sahota. And oh my god, did I love this novel. It's about three young Sikh Indian men who immigrate to the UK on, in an undocumented, kind of under the radar way. Finding a way to stay in the country legally is a big theme of the novel. The fourth major character in the novel is a young British born Sikh woman and it's the story of how their lives overlap. I've done a full review on this which you can look at but it really tugged on me. I love the writing. I will read anything that Sunjeev Sahota writes. Fully realized characters that I just fell in love with. I haven't been able to stop thinking about that novel. 
people will still be talking about this one in 20 or 50 years. Loved it! Next is a, a really amazingly deep reading experience that I had at the very end of December. And wow! I read To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. I had thought I might try to fit it in this year because I'd had such a great experience rereading Mrs. Dalloway in the fall. And then when I found out that Jess at Garden Scriptorium was planning a buddy read with Faraba at the Medieval Reader, I kind of invited myself to read along. And am I ever glad I did? So I did it on ebook when I was home in Canada, and I did it as an audio text combo, and it was just wonderful. I think it's my favorite. I need time to s to sit with it and maybe reread it before I can make that call because I had always thought Mrs. Dalloway was, but I think I, I loved it more. So this is a story. There's not much plot here. It's about the Ramsey family and their friends holidaying on the Hebrides. I think the Isle of Sky, Isle of Sky, I believe, in the Hebrides. And they're planning a trip the next day to the lighthouse. And James is the little boy, I think he's five or six years old. And his mother, Mrs. Ramsey, knows how excited little James is to go to the lighthouse tomorrow. But the father, Mr. Ramsey, who's an old poop, he's poo-pooing. No, no, it's the weather's going to be terrible. We can't. We won't be able to go. We won't be able to go. And that, the that's basically the theme of the novel. Cast of characters is wonderful, and I really connect with Virginia Woolf's fiction emotionally. You get pulled into everybody's consciousness and it flits from character to character and these really banal happenings. There's a dinner that night with you know, 14 or 15 people. It's one of the most amazing scenes in modern literature. One of the friends is Lily Briscoe, who's a painter. I don't think she's much of a painter, but amateur and maybe not that good, but there's a lot about painting and making art and small moments and human connection and being a parent and being an intellectual and lighting matches in the dark. Just beautiful. The next one is equally hard to talk about, but what an amazing debut collection of short fiction. Atrib and Other Stories by Eli Williams. This is on the list for the Republic of Consciousness Prize, which is a prize for innovative experimental writing. And the prize was created by Neil Griffiths. These stories are really hard to talk about. So just fast forward through my jumbled attempt to put two sentences together and just read the book. They are like micro fictions that take an image or a situation or a word, usually all three, and like fireworks, Eli Williams takes you on a wild ride. My favorite, and I happen to agree with Neil Griffiths, because, you know, we're on par intellectually, <laughs> is Smote, where a young woman is standing in front of an abstract painting with her lover, wanting to kiss her in front of this painting, but because of homophobia and because of what the painting evokes for her and because of all the words that get tripped in the dictionary in her brain can't bring herself to. I got a little bit lost in the middle of that story and what I did was I pulled up the painting and then it just was this synesthetic and deep experience. It's like one of the best short stories I read this year. So many other stories. There's one story about a, a lover waking up under the other woman's arm in bed. It's their first date. The genders are not clear and immaterial. And they had drunkenly trapped a bee in the glass on the bedside table. And there's a bird making obnoxious noises outside the window. And from that little micro scenario, Eli Williams just creates this story that just... There are just no words. She took them all. Check it out. And the last one, another one. I read quite a few short little books on the plane, on the 12 hours of airplane travel back to Japan on New Year's Eve. And this last one was Who Will Run the Frog Hospital by Lori Moore. I've done a separate review of this. I really loved it. A late 30s American woman on holiday with her philandering husband in Paris 
Her marriage is crumbling. She's lost the sense of who she is. And on this rather uninspired holiday, reflecting back on the only time in her life where she really felt alive and connected to another human being, which was when she was 15 years old, and her friend that she met working together at a really corny amusement park. Enough said. Please check out my review for more, but made me think about getting older, sense of possibilities, which is so wide open when we're 15 years old and which seems to shrink ever smaller as we get into middle age. And those themes are explored beautifully here. So I hope the books just recommend themselves to you. Thanks for watching.